Good evening to all of you. I'm Dr. Padma Gunaratna, President of Sri Lanka Medical Association. I hope you hear me. I welcome all of you to SLMA webinar series. We would be having a webinar on quarantine policy in Sri Lanka, appraisal following vaccination today. While I welcome all of you to SLMA webinar series, let me tell you that we have lined up three eminent speakers for this webinar. We have Dr. Dilhani Samrasekara, who would talk to us on current quarantine measures in Sri Lanka. She is the consultant community physician, quarantine unit Ministry of Health. And then Dr. Anjali Gamage, she would be talking to us on health and economic implications of reviewing the current quarantine policy. Uh, she is the consultant community physician and senior lecturer, paraclinical department, faculty of medicine, General Sir John Kotalavala, Defense University. And also we have an overseas speaker who is known to all of us, Professor Suranjit Seneviratna. He would be addressing evidence for plausible amendments of quarantine policy. And in fact, I must remind that we, the Sri Lanka amended the policy recently, but then we'll see that whether there is room for further improvement. Professor Suranjit Seneviratna is the professor and consultant in Clinical Immunology and Allergy Institute of Immunity and Transplantation Royal Free Hospital and University College London and Health Services Laboratories, London, UK. Uh, so to commence the webinar, I have invited one of our very distinguished colleague, Dr. Harsha Satish Chandra, who is the president of the uh, College of Inter Internal Medicine. He would be the moderator for the evening. Harsha, over to you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Madam, for that, those kind words of introduction. I think it's a timely topic that we have uh, chosen to uh, deliberate on today uh, in this vaccination era where vaccination is progressing at a fast rate globally. Uh, we have to review certain uh, COVID measures that we've undertaken so far. And uh, one of the important uh, measures is the quarantine policy. And uh, as uh, Dr. Padma Dunatna said, uh, we have lined up three eminent speakers. And let me first uh, introduce the first speaker, who is uh, Dr. Dilhani Samara Sekara, who is consultant community physician and uh, head of the quarantine unit of the Ministry of Health. Uh, may I invite Dilhani to talk to us on uh, the current quarantine measures in Sri Lanka. Over to you, Dilhani. Thank you very much for inviting me uh, for this uh, webinar. Uh, so first of all, we must know the difference between the quarantine and isolation. The quarantine means the restriction of activities and or separation from others of suspect persons who are not ill or of suspect baggage, containers, conveyances, or goods in such a manner as to prevent the possible spread of infection or contamination. Actually, during the quarantine, people, we think that they are exposed, but they don't have symptoms or they are not positive for infection. But based on the exposure, we quarantine them. But if the people uh, become positive or having symptoms, we do isolation for them. That is separation of ill or contaminated persons or affected baggage, containers, conveyances, or goods or postal passes. If they are contaminated or suppose if the people are infected or symptomatic, we isolate them. So, during the COVID uh, pandemic in the country, so we have considered the incubation period to quarantine. 
initially. So incubation period is 2 to 14 days. So mandatory quarantine period is taken as 14 days. Currently, we mainly do the quarantining process for two groups of people. That is mainly for those people for close contacts of a positive patient and for travelers arriving from overseas. So what are the quarantine measures for close contact of a positive patient? So it should be, a, the person should be a close contact of a positive person and the duration usually according to the WHO guidelines, if symptomatic or asymptomatic, up to uh, two days backwards. But in our country, we assess the situation, health staff and the health staff, uh, especially the MOH, PHIs and the other doctors in the clinical setup, they assess the condition and uh, they assess the first contact, that is the close contacts and send them for quarantine. So we do currently mandatory home quarantine for 14 days. PCR to be arranged by the area MOH. First PCR is usually done on day seven, but depending on the availability of resources, the exit, P exit PCR is a must by 11th day to 14th day. Then after receiving the negative results, they will be released from the quarantine. So there's another group like releasing after completing 14 days if PCR is negative only. But if suppose that person is positive again, then his close contacts will be taken as the immediate close contacts and they will be quarantined. If positive, MOH will arrange them to be admitted to an isolation center or a hospital depending on the symptoms and the age. Quarantine measures for travelers arriving from overseas. Currently, we have a lot of travelers arriving from overseas. Usually, the incoming travelers should get the prior approval to enter to the country from the foreign ministry and thereafter from the uh, Civil Aviation Authority. Some people need to get the approval from, from the Department of Immigration and Immigration. Usually, with the foreign ministry approval, the, directly the civil aviation also will give the approval. There's another group coming as uh, travelers arriving via Sri Lanka tourism. So they should get the approval to enter the country from Sri Lanka tourism. Currently, we have asked the travelers to come with a pre-departure COVID-19 test in English. For, for foreigners, they have to come with a PCR test, but some airlines, they ask for uh, 72 hours PCR, but we have asked for uh, the test to be conducted within 96 hours prior to embarkation. It should be, they should have a negative COVID-19 PCR report. Sri Lankans or dual citizens, they can have either PCR test or a rapid antigen test done within 48 hours prior to embarkation. This depends on the requirement of the airline also. If they say that they have to do a PCR test, they have to come with a PCR, negative PCR report. And uh, they have, now airlines usually, they give the health declaration forms of Sri Lanka. Otherwise they can get the HDF forms from the arriving airport. Uh, the traveler has to submit the field health, field health declaration form to airport health office counters at the arriving airport. And also if they have been vaccinated. Now currently we have issued another guideline on 18. As per that guideline, they have to come with the proofs of the vaccination uh, records in English. Right? Then uh, there are people who have not vaccinated. There are people who have vaccinated. And also if they have uh, come with the vaccination, cards after two weeks of vaccination we can allow them to go home this is for Sri Lankans or dual citizens they are allowed to go home after day one PCR anyway everybody will be quarantined at a quarantine center or a quarantine hotel to do the on arrival PCR testing so Sri Lankan dual citizen or resident visa holders 
if completed the recommended doses of covid-19 vaccination and arriving after 2 weeks of completion of vaccination day one pcr is done at a quarantine hotel or a center if negative they can be released from the quarantine hotel or center but with the current guidelines once they go to their home they have to inform the area in moh and they are released from the quarantine but day seven pcr they have to do and submit it to the area moh so this group the sri lankan dual citizen or resident visa holders if not obtain the vaccination or not completed the recommended doses of covid-19 vaccination arriving within 2 weeks of vaccination or currently sometimes the parents are vaccinated the children are anyway not vaccinated so currently they have to go anywhere to the uh, hotel or a center on day 1 with the current measures if they are staying at a hotel pcr after the day 1 pcr these people they don't have uh, the vaccination uh, within the uh, sometimes less than 2 weeks they are coming sometimes they have must have been vaccinated but coming with children who are not vaccinated so they have to do the day 1 pcr testing again Uh, if they are undergoing hotel quarantine they have to do the pcr after completion of 7 days once the negative results are available they are uh, they can go home and they have to be home quarantine for the balance period out of 14 days <coughs> and uh, this group as they are not vaccinated we have con- consider we consider them as not vaccinated so while traveling they have to take special measures after releasing from the hotel quarantine on day 7 so some people without vaccination they may be staying in the quarantine centers with shared facilities so they have to do the after yes, day one pcr they have to do the pcr after completion of day 10 so once negative results are available they are released from the center and mandatory home quarantine for the balance period out of 14 days so once they go home they have to inform the moh area moh so there is another group uh, travelers arriving via sri lanka tourism they should get the approval to enter the country from sri lanka tourism there is a website so they can apply through that but this is not only for the tourists some people uh, even the dual citizens some sri lankans also coming they are coming via this route also but they have to abide with the rules given to uh, this category so this group also travelers via sri lanka tourism we think that they don't have a house here sometimes some people they have a house also this when the guideline was prepared we think them also as tourists so if completed recommended doses of covid-19 vaccination and arriving after 2 weeks of completion of vaccination day one pcr is done at the safe and secure level 1 hotel if negative stay at that hotel or they can move between level 1 hotels and visit the important sites sites in a biosecure bubble and also travelers uh, after like travelers was sri lanka tourism with completed vaccination so after completion of 7 days if negative they can be released from the quarantine after informing the area in which so vaccinated crowd is coming via sri lankan to sri lanka tourism they will be released only after uh, getting the pcr report on day 7 so there's another group Uh, travelers via sri lanka tourism with no vaccination or incomplete vaccination or arrive within less than 2 weeks of vaccination so as usual day one pcr is done if negative they have to be there for 14 days but they can move between the level 1 hotels because current guideline even though we have mentioned not to move uh, because we have allowed them to move within the level 1 hotels in a biosecure bubble exit pcr is done depending on the date of departure suppose if the traveler wants to go back uh, in about 8 day 
day six or seven PCR will be done. But if they want to stay for more than fourteen days, day eleven to fourteen PCR will be done, and they will be released after uh, receiving after completion of the fourteen days. They can uh, go to the community. So that's all mainly for the uh, the travelers and also for the people uh, who are first contacts detected from Sri Lanka. But currently we are trying to amend this guideline depending on the current knowledge and also other risk requests. But still uh, the current latest one we are we are thinking of issuing, but still under discussion. Thank you. Uh like to invite the audience to uh, uh, see the discussion uh, by text as well. And we will leave time for uh, questions. Uh, moving on to the next uh, topic, uh, uh, that is actually on uh, health and economic implications of uh, uh, And to talk to us on this, uh, I would like to uh, uh, Dr. Anuji Ramadu, who is the uh, Inside Committee President and Senior Lecturer, Pataja Mitsu, uh, 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 and I would, uh, good evening everyone. And I thank Dr. Padma Gunaratna and all at SLMA for this opportunity. And uh, this is a very timely uh, discussion. So as we all know, on March uh, 11th, the WHO declared COVID-19 as a pandemic. So to quote Dr. Uh, uh, the Director General of WHO, he declared pandemic is not a word to use carelessly or lightly. It's a word that if misused can cause unreasonable fear or unjustified acceptance that the fight is over, leading to unnecessary suffering and catastrophe. So likewise, the economic impact due to COVID-19, which spread across the globe, caused reduction of productivity and loss of life, business closures, trade disruptions, and disruption of tourism industry. Um, so, um, human resources is one of the important determinants of economic growth of a country. Labor productivity and human capital are directly affected by morbidity and mortality. All decisions should balance benefit to harm, and healthcare decision making should consider resource availability, the scarcity and of resources, the opportunity cost, and also the consequences and trade off arising through such decisions. Okay, so moving on to our very popular graph, crushing the curve, which was an import, which was very important at the time to buy us time until a vaccine or a treatment was available. Of course, there were pros and cons of both suppression and mitigation. Suppression and mitigation caused economic impact that it led to substantial economic and social costs, which negatively impact which had a negative impact on uh, in the country, uh, both in the short and also in the long term. So as Dr. Dilhani mentioned, quarantine it is a mitigation measure that keeps someone away uh, who, ha who might have been exposed to the virus from away from others. Placing people in quarantine was a method to use to limit the spread of the disease. So like we discussed, this had its economic impact, but with was re very rarely highlighted, right? So economically speaking, controlling mortality and morbidity is also an investment. Human resources is one of the important determinants of economic growth of a country. The figure shows that how the control of disease can affect economic growth and highlights labor and productivity. So labor productivity and human capital are directly affected by morbidity and mortality. This shows this. A healthy life uh, lays the groundwork for a population which is productive, resulting in large outputs, income, and economic growth. So health strategies should not be hampered by merely considering the presence 
of economic adversities, but rather should take into account the economic impact over the longer term caused by morbidity and mortality. COVID-19 pandemic had caused direct impacts on income due to premature deaths, workplace absenteeism, reduction in productivity, and had created a negative supply shock with manufacturing productivity activity slowing down due to global supply chain disruptions and closure of factories and many business. So this is a linkage model to show the relationship between economic activities and the impact. So economic activities are interconnected as you can very well see through this. The, see in this slide, the several, the, and several channels could affect economic activities of a country. Households engage in employment and leisure activities to maximize their utility. And producers combine labor and capital to maximize their profit. The government collects taxes to finance the expenditure and redistribute for welfare. Although mitigation and suppression of the disease had many positive externalities from a health perspective, economically, it had many negative effects. So typically a health shock tend to be negative and would include decline in domestic demand, supply distribution, we all, we, we, we went through this, we experienced this and changing consumption patterns and investment. So mandatory quarantine or self-isolation and lockdowns due to quarantine, uh, COVID-19 could, uh, did result in substantial economic impact in Sri Lanka. So why assess the economic impact? Treatment and disease control decisions made in any circumstance should also consider resource availability and scarcity of these resources. So accurate knowledge about cost of illness is essential to formulate and prioritize healthcare policies and intervention, and eventually to allocate the resources. So therefore, the purpose of these cost of illness studies are to argue that uh, policies on a disease should be given a high priority in a policy agenda setting, the cost estimate help appropriate target, appropriately target specific problems and re revise the guidelines and serves as a baseline measure to determine the efficacy of health policies, programs, or any type, other type of interventions. A little bit on the types of cost. So depending on the uh, expenditure data, cost be, can be categorized into direct, indirect, and psych psychic cost. So the direct healthcare cost can be further categorized into direct healthcare and direct non-healthcare. And, um, uh, and so why am I telling you this? Because numbers are eye openers for policymakers. We did a costing analysis considering placing paper in quarantine. And in the next few slides, I will brief you on the findings. So the methodology was, this was a scenario-based costing study, which assessed the direct and indirect impact due to quarantine, placing people in quarantine. Cost analysis considered the system perspective for direct and indirect costs. Since we didn't have data, the actual numbers, we gathered data from various sources and available literature. So data for indirect costs, the number of uh, days absent from work related to uh, patients and their first contacts were identified through guidelines from the Ministry of Health. And calculation of the first degree contacts. Um, so calculation, again, we had a, a several assumptions on this. So the, uh, because we didn't have proper data in Sri Lanka, uh, so uh, calculation of the first degree contacts and non-quarantine infected person, there was uh, evidence for this, may, can infect up to 20 people a day. So based on that, for uh, 14 days, the index ca case can put 280 people at risk and causing the spread of the virus. Okay, so and if the RO is, uh, which represents the average number of people infected by one infectious in, in, individual, if there were no preventive measures, the RO was taken as 5.4 on, so one person can in, uh, therefore infect 5.4. And with preventive measures intact, the average, uh, the RO was, to, was taken to be as 1.4. All three scenarios were considered in calculating the loss of production and uh, due to quarant uh, quarantine, the primary contacts. 
So labor force participation, daily earnings, and the mean per capita income, we all gather this data using uh, literature and um, uh, talking uh, with experts. So uh, the direct cost due to quarantine, quarantine hotel cost per day per patient was uh, around 1,610. Okay. So hotel costs in the sense what the government incurred in providing the quarantine related services. So the mean income loss due to hospitalization per patient for 14 days or keeping uh, a patient, uh, a person away from work for the informal sector, it amounted to uh, uh, about 11,500 per day for an informal sector worker and for a government sector worker, the loss to the government because the worker, the employer, employee didn't sort of in, incur this. It was the government. It was about thirty thousand per day. So this slide uh, shows the indirect cost due to COVID nineteen uh, data as of thirty first of January. Considering the loss of work or loss of output. The patient being home quarantined for 14 days after discharge from a hospital would account to about 32 million. And putting a primary contact of the index case in quarantine, if he puts 280 people at risk, would be about 166 billion. And putting the primary contacts of the index case in quarantine, if the RO was 5.4, uh, would account for 37 billion. These are in billions. And putting a primary contact into uh, quarantine, if the RO was 1.4, would be about uh, 11 billion. So as you can see, the figures are really high. And then this one and the next slide is calculate, calculating the lost earnings of a government sector worker if, uh, if he died due to disease. Uh, or uh, uh, removed from the workforce due to uh, disability. So um, for a government sector worker the, or and an informal sector worker, the total lost earnings would be about 4.5 million and uh, 6.2 million respectively. So therefore placing people in quarantine and protecting them and mitigating, suppressing the disease was important, uh, were really important. Uh, measures that the government took. So hence, it's obvious uh, that the adverse outcomes due to placing people in quarantine uh, was big. So the, these were loss of employment and daily earnings, especially the blue collar workers and household level impact was huge. Loss of productivity was, uh, it, the, it, this resulted in loss of productivity stress and stigma related, related to quarantine uh, was huge and limit of travel. Therefore, travel related jobs were also affected. So things that we can consider. So this is a new virus and a new experience for the whole world. What's important is that the disease evolve as the disease evolves, so should the decision taken to control the disease. This, and this should be based on evidence that is available keeping in mind each country is different and therefore the decision should suit the country context. And the considerable fraction of the cost of COVID-19 is incurred in terms of lost earnings or output. And there will be a major loss in terms of lifetime earnings caused by mortality and morbidity. So COVID-19 prevention and treatment strategies should consider the cost incurred by each strategy for effective and efficient decision making. Reducing the length of quarantine may make it easier for people to be in quarantine. A shorter quarantine period also can lessen the stress on the public health system, especially when new infections are rapidly rising. And reducing quarantine for close contacts of persons with COVID-19 can be done using symptoms monitoring and diagnostic testing. And monitoring and evaluation of these changes are also important and because data-driven policy decision-making is really important. And data is valuable in decision-making and it should be made available. Okay, lastly, I would like to sincerely thank uh, Prof. Amalati Silva because this was a teamwork, not just 
by me. Uh, she, um, Prof. Amala De Silva, she's my guru, the mentor, and also my supervisor, and Dr. Kenneth Arlanandam for the support he rendered in doing the direct cost analysis, and also Dr. Mangala Samaravikrama, who did the loss of work related calculations, and last but not least, President and the Council of SLMA. Thank you. Harsha, you can't hear you. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. Better. Yes. Sorry. 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 Something had happened. Yeah. No. I was saying. Uh, I was thanking Dr. Alanji Gamage for that excellent uh, talk on the cost analysis of uh, quarantining. And I think uh, we learned a lot and probably her work will uh, guide us to sort of review our policies and see where we can improve on, on it. Uh, moving on to the next item, uh, uh, I think uh, it gives me great pleasure in inviting Professor Ranjit Seniviratna, my good friend. Uh, he is a consultant in clinical immunology and allergy institute of uh, uh, immunology. Royal Free Hospital and University College London. Uh, now, uh, before moving on to Saranjit, I, I would just like to say that uh, uh, the vaccines, the main role of the vaccines has been to reduce disease severity, uh, to reduce uh, uh, deaths, ICU admissions and hospital admissions. But uh, an important secondary role of the vaccine is to prevent uh, transmission. So I think, uh, when deciding whether vaccination is going to help us with, uh, uh, with uh, uh, you know, uh, change of quarantine policy, I think we would like uh, Suranjit to uh, elaborate a bit on that aspect of uh, the role of the vaccine as well. Over to you, Suranjit. Thank you. Thank you, Harsha. Uh, I'll just share my slide. Uh, firstly, let me thank... Uh, now, wait. Now, how do I get that? to move this away. Uh, just a minute, I just want to... Oh, okay. Right. So thank you very much, uh, Arsha. Thank you very much, Madam, for inviting me to uh, give this talk uh, uh, at, uh, at this symposium. And what I'll try, uh, it, it would be great because I will look at the aspect of vaccines uh, as put in some evidence of plausible amendments in the quarantine policy. So if I uh, firstly speak to you, uh, firstly, let me, before I forget, these are the people in my in the group uh, who has helped a lot in this. There are different groups that uh, we have, and this is the sort of economic and social determinant group. And uh, thanks a lot as economists, as uh, epidemiologists, etc. that's Visula, and a lot of people who have contributed to this ongoing work that we are doing. So if we look at the number of cases and deaths of COVID-19, that's the first thing we should start. I mean, it has been a major pandemic over the past close to one and a half years or one and a quarter years. 125 million people, deaths, see the amount of deaths, the UK, US and India, big numbers. It's in millions, this should be 11.7 million and hundreds of thousands of deaths. And in one way, Sri Lanka has controlled it to a great extent by uh, when compared to several other uh, countries in the world, we are around 91,000 people cases and unfortunately 552 deaths. So we have done very well so far. Let us see how we can continue this and land the plane, as I would say, safely with this with regards to this pandemic. So vaccines, seven approved. Four abandoned, very important because the idea is I've spoken about vaccines previously. Uh, the belief is that you know all vaccines that they try, tried developing were all approved. No, certain vaccines were abandoned, and it's seven that have been approved for uh, for full use. And there is a whole lot of other vaccines that are in development, 
and that would be needed for this world. We cannot vaccinate the world with one or two vaccines. We need the whole amount of vaccine because there is massive vaccine shortage at the moment. You can see on a daily basis that sort of big arguments that are going on between the UK and uh, uh, the EU with regards to vaccines. So there is a massive shortage in every part of the world. Uh, I have spoken about the vaccine landscape and uh, this has written about this. This can be written, read in some of the uh, publications in Sri Lanka, so I won't go into great detail about that today. But just to tell you, just as a parting message, that it is against a spike protein, the, the protein on the surface of the virus that the vaccines are directed, the spike protein that is shown here in this uh, figure. And another important concept to remember is it takes time for the immune system to produce antibodies and certain types of white cells, B cells and T cells. This is the sort of a time scale and you can see you give the vaccine and it takes some, not the vaccine, the infection or the vaccine, it's similar. What we're trying to do with the vaccines are trying to mimic uh, the person and produce the immunity without person getting unwell. And the important thing to remember, it takes some time. So what is the take home message here? That just because you get a vaccine today doesn't mean that tomorrow you're immune. It takes time for the immune system to build up its immune response. And that is a very important aspect to be, to be remembered when getting the vaccine. And that is why when they say completed vaccination, it is 14 days after the second or the first dose, I'll tell you, depending on the vaccine, which I will mention. So if you want to get more information about the immune aspects of vaccine in two days time, we'll be talking at the uh, Allergy Immunology uh, uh, Society uh, and then uh, more aspects about the gynecological or obstetric aspects, or obstetric aspects and psychology aspects in the uh, College of GP session. So these are on Sunday and on Wednesday, but I will focus on the question that we are trying to answer. Vaccines have been rolled out. More than 460 million doses of vaccine have been given around the world. Big numbers, 460 million. USA leads it with a big over 100,000, well over 100,000, and these are the other countries. But an important thing we have to remember is you can see quite a lot of rich countries in this uh, area. India has taken into vaccination a big way, and that is a big very important uh, aspect to be considered and they are accelerating, but that is an, again a very important thing. We cannot afford to only vaccinate rich countries because this pandemic is around the world. It is not in one part of the world or one region. And we have to remember that if one part of the world is not, not protected from SARS-CoV-2, the virus, variants could occur and that can mess up the whole apple cart. So that is a very important aspect to remember, but over 460 million doses of vaccination has been given so far. And the US is about 2 million doses every week. So they are leading, as I said, uh, Israel has come in very high because they have vaccinated a great amount of their population and the UK has vaccinated at least half the adult population. So what I will divide this talk into is vaccine, uh, COVID-19 vaccine efficacy and effectiveness. Then I'll talk about the variants, the preventive measures in the context of vaccination and population attributes and behavior, which we have to take into account when we are dealing with people. We are not dealing with inanimate objects. We are dealing with people who have their own beliefs. So that is a very important uh, message to come out. Now, if I, I'll take this quite uh, sort of uh, slowly, just to give you this concept, the virus can infect the person. Not everyone who gets an infection gets disease. And the disease can be mild, moderate, or severe. So you can be infected without a disease. The disease can be mild, moderate, severe. The disease can result in hospitalization, ITU, or death. Those are what we do not want to happen. Because if they go into hospital, a lot of hospital care is taken, ITU and death. That is what we want to avoid. So the first idea of vaccination is to try and reduce those, hospital, ITU, and death. 
severe disease. Now, infected people can transmit disease. Disease people with a disease can transmit disease. So that is a very important aspect to remember because the vaccinations, it is very effective against severe disease. Hospital ITU deaths are reduced massively in Israel, in the UK, in England, in Scotland, etc. We have to remember about infection and you must not forget that. Efficacy is the, the data we get from a clinical trial, controlled clinical trial. Effectiveness is what we see in real world scenario. And that is very important. And that is what I will try to tell you about the real world scenario now, the data that is coming out from the real world scenario. So what are we doing with these vaccines? What are the things that we are trying to look at? Symptomatic laboratory confirmed COVID-19, including severe forms, you're trying to reduce that symptomatic. Secondly, asymptomatic infection. I told you the infection part. They are not symptomatic, and then the transmission. So the first thing when you have a pandemic is to reduce the people dying, get into hospital and get into ITU care. Efficacy, you report overall efficacy, but you have to look at elderly, young adults. And you know with the AstraZeneca vaccine that has been discussed quite a lot, elderly. Underlying health condition, immune deficient patients, hypertension, diabetes, obesity, and other, immune, other health conditions and in different races and ethnicities, because just because it may be very effective in one race, we have to look across the, the different race and ethnicity. And that is very important in certain vaccine studies to include those, the real world data is important. So is it efficacious? Yes, it is efficacious. We have very efficacious vaccine. This was the Pfizer, the Pfizer uh, study that showed the efficacious uh, uh, activity with the Pfizer vaccine, there was 95% wonderful, uh, wonderful results of 95% efficacy. Efficacy. Then you come to the Moderna vaccine, which is in the US, still not come to the UK, and it's limited because the, most of it has been used, but it's been approved in the UK. Again, extremely good uh, 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 efficacy of 94.1%. You can see in the blue line, it's placebo and mRNA vaccine, which is the mRNA vaccine, you can see in the red line. So very effective, vac uh, very efficacious vaccines. These are clinical trials. The Oxford uh, AstraZeneca vaccine, again, you can see the people who are vaccinated are in the red line and the others are in the blue, uh, people who are given the meningitis vaccine. Again, the separation. So once again, the Oxford vaccine was efficacious. And then the subsequent uh, publication showed that it is better to give the vaccine at 12 weeks rather than a shorter period because the effect, the immunogenicity and the effectiveness, the if efficacious, uh, efficacy is very much better if it is given at 12 weeks. So we have studies to show that the Pfizer, the Moderna, the, the AstraZeneca vaccine are efficacious vaccine. And these are the characteristics of the vaccines that we talk about at the moment and they've been used in millions of doses. The Pfizer vaccine, the Moderna, AstraZeneca, the Russian vaccine, Sputnik V, and the J&J vaccine, which has Johnson vaccine, which has been approved in the, uh, again, uh, used in the US. Remember, it's only one dose with the uh, Janssen vaccine. Others are two doses. See the storage temperature, two to eight degrees in the lower vaccines here. And then the uh, mRNA vaccines at a uh, very much colder temperature. The effectiveness, see the great effectiveness all over 60%. Uh, very effective vaccines and the cost. There's a differential cost, the cheapest being the AstraZeneca vaccine, but the other cost and the most expensive, the Moderna vaccine. So these are available to us, but, and with these vaccinations being available to us, the UK government set out a beautiful program. They identified nine groups of people to give these vaccines. And now these nine groups of people have received these vaccines. Uh, over, over 50 years of age are being getting the vaccine at the moment. But this is the criteria in which they went, the care workers, the over 80, 75, etc. They, they use this in giving the vaccinations, rolling the vaccines out. More than 25 million vaccines have been given. But the issue is, we know about efficaciousness, 
Now, what about effectiveness in a community? in a real world setting. We want real world needs. That is what we want. How can we give it to people? How can we control this pandemic? Because the first thing is to reduce severity, uh, death and ITU care, but now we want to reduce asymptomatic and also transmission. So what is the real world data? And this is a summary of the real world data, which I will show you here. In the real world, in the, in, we have data from the US, in England, in uh, Scotland, and Israel, and a summary of it, which I'll show the studies after I go, just go through fast the studies for this talk. And you can see that Pfizer Moderna, 69% effective, uh, uh, it is effective and 60% lower hospitalization. Then in England, healthcare workers, the Pfizer and, and the AstraZeneca vaccine, again, very good. Uh, reduction in infection, even in people over the age of eight years. And in Israel, when they, they were given two doses of Pfizer vaccine, 90 to 94% effectiveness. And there was a fourfold decrease in viral load. Now that's very important because if the viral load is reduced, even if the person is infected and doesn't get the disease, then the chance of transmission is reduced. So that is very important to know that the viral load had a fourfold decrease in viral load. So this is a summary of the effectiveness studies that were done in, with the different vaccines so far. It's just coming out. A lot of real world data is coming out. I'll just run through the real world data. I won't go into each study in detail, but this was the study from uh, the US Mayo Clinic, which showed that the real world effectiveness in reducing uh, SARS-CoV-2 was quite high. It was uh, about 88.7%. This was the uh, first study that it will be coming out, the real world study. In England, you can see once vaccination started, you can see how the curve changed. After vaccine, it took some time, just a little bit of time because people had to get vaccinated. And that's a very important concept to remember. But now the curve has changed and the level of infections, level of hospitalization, et cetera, has reduced and deaths have reduced remarkably in this group of uh, patients in England. These are the two studies, the Hall study, which again showed it to be effective, the Pfizer vaccine and the uh, uh, Oxford vaccine, which are mainly used. And this was the second study from England, which showed that even a single dose of either vaccine provides significant protection of COVID-19. And that was the reason they delayed the time period between giving the two, vac uh, two dose of vaccine and offered a similar level of protection in older adults. Now, this is wonderful data from the vaccine in a real world setting. The Scottish study was very similar. A single dose of the Pfizer vaccine or the Oxford vaccine resulted in substantial redu reduction in risk of COVID-19 hospitalization in Scotland. So you had the US, the, the England, the Scottish studies, and then you have the Israeli studies. And this was published in the New England Journal of uh, Medicine. And you can immediately see those who are vaccinated in the blue and those who were not vaccinated, uh, who, were, uh, who were not vaccinated, you can see in the red and immediately you can find out the reduction across a whole range of uh, outcomes, including uh, symptomatic disease, hospitalization, severe uh, uh, disease and death. So this was an important outcome study that came out very, very recently. Other studies have been done in Israel, which showed a reduction in these different parameters. And you can see when it were the uh, different study which recalculated that quite a lot of close to the, after the first dose of vaccine, when it's coming close to second dose of vaccine, you can see the amount of protection that the pe people are having at that level. And that was the reason for delaying the uh, second dose of vaccine up to three months so that you would be able to give more people the vaccine. Now, the, the graph on your left, just remember that there was slight increase at the beginning before the amount of cases, the infectivity reduced. And the reason was that the wrong assumption by people that just because they got the vaccine today, that from tomorrow they can just go and do anything they want. They can remove their masks, they can meet in big groups, etc. That is not so because you need some period 
for the immune response to get activated and come into, into play. That's a very important thing to remember. So this is again the studies that are showing that if the effectiveness in the US, England, Scotland is similar, Israel, and a fourfold decrease in viral load. Next, we come on to the viral variants because that's a very important thing that is taking the world again, uh, very important aspect. I've written quite a lot on this in the Sri Lankan press, etc. There are four important variants we would consider the, the standard variant, which we had before the UK variant, 117, 1351, which is South African, P1 and P2, which are the Brazilian variants. So this has been, you can read these articles if you want to get more information, but remember UK, South African, Brazilian, there are two variants. And they did studies in the lab and they found that the amount of neutralization, virus neutralization by the taking the blood of the patients who receive this vaccine, you can see immediately on the bar four, the South African variant, the neutralization was reduced, while the UK variant, that is bar two, it was similar to the other, other wild type. So that's a very important concept to remember. It was reduced with the South African and to an extent with the Brazilian, but mainly with the South African. Another study showed the same phenomena. You can see number B, it was similar, which is the, the wild type. And then you can find that wild type against, uh, against the UK variant. But then you can find on the right-hand side, when it comes to the Brazilian variant or the South African variant, that is D, there was a reduction and of neutralite. That, that's a very important concept to remember. When it comes to the Oxford vaccine, it was very effective against the UK variant. And that's a variant that is spreading around the world at the moment. But it, we know that uh, data that came out from the uh, South African study of the Oxford vaccine there, it was not effective against the South African variant. So these are important considerations to be considered when we are designing the way we release the brakes, etc. Because when you're land in the plane, you must take this into account. When a pilot is coming to land the plane, they do not tell the people to take off their seat belts, go to the toilet, go and have their meals, etc. at that time. So we have to guide the plane to, take, to bring, we are in a pandemic, we have major health losses, we have major economic losses, we have major social uh, problems. So we have to balance all those in landing and ensuring that we come to power without getting this pandemic going out of control. So this is again a sort of a snapshot of the uh, variant studies. There's a reduction neutralization with uh, with the South African variant, while the UK variant was minimal, this was the mutation that caused big problem. We don't have one title that we can measure and say, okay, you're safe to do this or you're safe to do that. We don't have a biological correlate of uh, effectiveness. We know that the J&J vaccine, which is used in the U US, was not as effective in South Africa, and it is effective against the, U uh, the Oxford, it's effective against the UK variant. Uh, we know that it, the vaccines are effective against the UK variant that is circulating in the world at the moment. So those are important concepts to remember when to talk about the uh, effectiveness that is real world data and with regards to different vaccine variants that are going around the world. Right. So someone is also having a talk. So but if you look at the preventive measures in the context of vaccination, now these have been going on for some time, comprehensive preventive measures, wearing masks, physical distance, avoiding crowds, poorly ventilated space, hand hygiene, travel guidance, works place, and these have been in every country, and you have to follow these guidelines until a certain amount of the population becomes immune, because they have and we know that they have individual societal costs. You can imagine the number of problems different countries are having to keep individual lockdown, society is locked down, there's a lot of resistance, etc. And the West is far more than in, in other, certain other countries. So there is a big pro problem when it comes to, uh, uh, to, to, to only doing this. And that is the reason why we're taking vaccinations an important uh, important step together with these to be able to bring this pandemic under control.
Now, fully vaccinated means greater or equal to two weeks after the second dose for these three vaccines, the Pfizer, Moderna, Oxford, or if it's the one dose vaccine, it's after the single dose. Now, that is what is taken as fully vaccinated. Using these, the CDC has come up with different, different. They are trying to release the brakes, trying to land the plane. They're trying to give people something to hope for. They can visit other fully vaccinated people. They can visit low risk unvaccinated people, refrain from quarantine and testing after exposure if they do not have symptoms of COVID-19. So that is fully vaccinated. In Zealand, Sri Lanka is following a very, very similar route to this. And there are uh, at the moment, the guideline is because we have data only up to about three months to six months. Actually, now with vaccines, we have with uh, infection, we have six to eight months data and we have more data with vaccine. So this is the data as at the moment. And it's a change in field. It's not a static field. So there is a change in field up to three months of receiving the final dose, but two weeks after the last the second dose or the first dose, depending on the vaccine they use. And the testing, this has been gone. So 96 hours, 72 hours. I mean, different countries have different regulation, but this is quite standard, which are followed by many, many countries. So there is a, this is coming into place. European countries, the epidemic seems to be picking up again. Greece and Spain economically are losing. They want to reduce restrictions. Flights from the UK, they want to get people coming there. They want people spending money. However, the UK is clamping down. The, there is, there is a suggestion that there are people will be given a fine of £5,000 if they go on holiday during summer. They want people to holiday in the So these are things, societal things, which have to be taken into account because uh, when you... When you uh, design certain uh, uh, guidelines, etc. These have to be taken by different countries depending on the circumstance that they are involved. And the, finally, I will talk to, I spoke, spoke to you about the effectiveness of vaccine, variants, preventive measures and population attributes and behavior. But that is another important concept to be remembered that when we are giving messages to people, it must be clear, unambiguous communication of benefits. What is the benefit of vaccine? Could we relax certain preventive measures to allow fully vaccinated persons to travel? Rather than telling people you can't travel, how can you travel safely? You have to balance all aspects. How can we, what are the benefits being able to return to a sort of normal life? feeling safe around people, resuming activities, going to work and school. And these have to be discussed and very clear messages have to be given to people so that they would take it on board and go ahead with the vaccination, get the immune population. And I've discussed aspects about immune population, et cetera, but the policy makers must know aspects regarding effectiveness, efficacy. We know there are very efficacious vaccines, the variant distribution and how the variants are changing and the different effectiveness of the vaccines that are coming through should be known. So what I've done during this quick 25 minutes was spoken to you about, told you about the important place that vaccination is having. I told you about infection, disease and transmission. Our first goal was to reduce disease. We are doing that very effectively. Now the goal is to see how much of infection and transmission is it reducing. It is indeed doing that, but there is some residual element which we should mitigate and control effectively. SARS-CoV-2 variants, a South African variant is troublesome. We have to ensure that vaccination runs through pass before there's such a lot of transmission that the variants more variants could come up. That's a very important thing. That is why countries like the UK, US are rushing into vaccine, but they cannot do that alone because there are other countries in the world. You cannot wait without vaccinating other countries. And the big problem here is with vaccine mandates, if you have a vaccine, you can travel. So therefore what happens is a 25-year-old in a country that has vaccines will be demanding vaccines because they want to travel, while a healthcare worker in Africa, in Asia, does not have the vaccine. Is that fair? I mean, that's, that's the aspect to be considered because, you know, 
just because the person wants to travel and you know, not 20 years of age is that fair that a healthcare worker or someone who really needs a vaccine in another part of the world doesn't get that preventive measures that have to be released in context of vaccination and the importance of population attributes and behavior has to be taken into account and taken in depending on the different population that is involved thank you thank you sanjit uh, for that uh, comprehensive talk uh, and uh, i i think uh, you've explained everything very nicely uh, uh, the science behind uh, the policies and i think that that's very important in uh, uh, taking into consideration any amendments that we are proposing to the quarantine policy uh, just a question that has been raised sanjit uh, uh, people who have had the illness and recovered fully Uh, uh do they sort of uh, require the vaccine or can they be thought of as uh, having immunity that lasts long enough a uh, very good, very very nice question uh, very good question so the the present guidance is anyone even if they have had infection they have had sars cov 2 uh, after one month they should go and get the vaccine the protection is up to about 3 months but after one month the people are uh, asked to go and get the vaccine uh the important thing is that after they have uh, three studies have come out now that after a single vaccine in a person who has had sars cov 2 after a uh, sars cov 2 in the past their immune response has been quite very good it has been really good it is better than somebody who has had two doses in one of the studies so the idea that has been postulated at the moment and put forward is those who were proven to have had sars cov 2 in the far, in the past that is covid 2 uh, covid 19 in the past can they receive one dose of vaccine however at the present moment the the guideline is that which is happening in the uk and the us if it is a two dose vaccine even if you have had sars cov 2 you go and get two doses but that guideline may change as more data comes in but so uh, it will because the thing is that once you get sars cov 2 you get antibodies you get cells and importantly it's not only antibodies it's cells and antibodies but the, then there can be some waning effect and that is why you want to go with vaccination to boost that effect on that sanjit uh, do we have data to say that a uh, person who had the illness has uh, protection you know uh, up to more than 6 months yes ago? absolutely absolutely so two two, two very good papers have come out uh, one from the san diego group in uh, that's uh, dan the first author which showed beautiful which showed protection up to 6 8 months that was a publication that uh, just came out in i think in cell or in science which showed that protection is lasting uh, after uh, infection up to 6 to 8 months mainly because it's antibody protection but also there is some waning of antibody but the t cell protection cd4 cd8 t cell protection is lasting out and i'll go into more details on thursday they're not thursday friday in two days time when i talk about the immune i didn't go into great detail in the immune aspect when i talk at the immunology update uh, that is there on friday i will show that data beautifully showing that there's protection up to 8 months now the data that is coming there was another group that has done up to 6 uh, to 8 months that is the group in scotland no, sorry in uh, in uh, stockholm uh, in the in sweden again they have shown data so there is data that's coming that it's lasting for some time the question that will come up from there is what about boosters because the idea is that the uk may get a booster the us may get a booster europe may get a booster in the summer because with to cover the variants the vaccines have been developed against variants so would they get a booster uh, some people are saying to give a third dose of a second do- two dose vaccine the issue is just imagine the population we have to remember first we are trying to struggling around the world to give even i mean give give women half the world population in one dose just imagine trying to get boosters where is the capacity but that has to be considered taken into account and the second thing is should would we be needing vaccines every year every two years i think we still don't have that data it could turn out that we may need a vaccine every two years or so probably not every year but still we are waiting for that data the o- original data said 
after eight months, we have some uh, protection of the infection. So we are waiting for that data because it's still vaccination process started in the world, only uh, in, a, in a real world in December. Uh, so Ranjit, now, uh, now Sri Lanka is obviously short of vaccines and, uh, and, uh, and you elaborated very uh, clearly why we should uh, get the first, I mean, the, the vaccine into more people as soon as possible. Is there any data to say that uh, uh, prolonging the second dose of the AstraZeneca vaccine beyond 12 weeks is of use or would you not advise on that? Uh, so the idea, the, the paper that came out said, had some data beyond 12 weeks, but the recommendation looking at the whole aspect of the whole perspective, that is, you don't only look at the, the sort of the time period, you know, getting people to go and get the second dose, etc. The idea has been so you get protection after the first dose, but it is up to a certain level. And then off, when you give it after 12 weeks, it's optimal protection where you get between 62 to 90 percent protection two weeks after the second dose. And that is what has been uh, about nine, eight, uh, close to 90 percent protection. That is what has been uh, said. So 12 weeks is the one that is because you have to have, you know, I think uh, uh, Dilhari and uh, Anjubit, uh, Anujibit uh, mentioned, you know, when you're uh, putting out a program, you have to have a set period and 12 weeks is the one that has been decided by the by the UK. They got, came in for a lot of stick when it came to the Pfizer vaccine and the manufacturer said, you know, why are you going to 12 weeks? Our study was only for uh, three weeks, except the Moderna was four way. However, the data that is coming out from Israel shows that even 12 weeks, the calculations show that uh, going beyond uh, four weeks would be, uh, three or four weeks would be beneficial as it will boost the immune system to a greater level. Thank you very much, Suranjit, for answering all those questions. Uh, this question is actually to Dr. Uh, Dilhani uh, Samrasekhar. Uh, uh, a question is there, uh, uh, a person is asking, what is the duration of quarantine for a fully vaccinated dual citizen arriving in Sri Lanka with a breastfed baby? Actually, in the current guideline, we have not specifically mentioned for the people coming uh, with children, but they have been fully vaccinated. But we have mentioned to use them as unvaccinated people because of the child. But currently, we are discussing to amend that, but still, uh, we are discussing it only. But as at today, they, if they are staying in a hotel, they can now day one PCR will be done. After day seven PCR, they will be released to their homes, but the balance period, they have to, up to 14 days, uh, they have to stay at home. But uh, currently discussing whether to release the vaccinated parents after going home, right? They can go for work, but the children have to stay at home. But as at today, after seven days, they will be released if they are staying at a hotel. Thank you, Dilhani. Then this question is also to you. There's a question on outbound travelers from Sri Lanka. So it's about uh, short visits, uh, people who intend to take short visits uh, 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 from Sri Lanka. Is there, a, is there any uh, discussion on reducing the duration of uh, uh, quarantining on return? I any alternative quarantine plan that is being discussed for such people who want to make visits out, short visits outside and come back to Sri Lanka? Because of the current, like our population majority have not been vaccinated, some relaxation is given only for people who are going for state visits or government officers going for government purposes, especially for the uh, like shorter period, less than seven days of duration from departure to arrival not in those countries from departure from Sri Lanka to arrival. That is for the, like the state visits or urgent things. Others, we are not going, uh, giving for the general public, if they are going for any other meeting or anything, private sector not given, or the foreigners or Sri Lankans who are going for major business uh, investments, right? So only those people are considered currently, uh, but if people are going for a shorter period, we are not giving them, a, they have to follow the common route. They have to get the approval from the foreign minister to return. That sort of thing is there. Uh, yes, thanks. And then there's another question on, uh, on the vaccination certificate. Uh, uh, people want to know whether an actual vaccination certificate is needed or whether a vaccination card issued in many countries as, as, as in Sri Lanka. Own proof, actually. 
proof of vaccination but some countries we heard that sometimes the app is there so we told them to get the their sri lankan foreign mission is there they are up to a law so because some if it is in the phone in the app right we they might not be able to get a certificate otherwise if they can it's better but the card is also considered if they bring a valid card i see uh i, I think we've had a very fruitful webinar and uh, I must thank uh, the three speakers, Dr. Dilhani Samrasekara, Dr. Anuji Gamage, and uh, Professor Suranjit Seniviratna for excellent talks and uh, answering our questions as well. Uh, and I must thank uh, the SLMA for giving this opportunity for, for the public and, and the community to get to know about these important uh, considerations. Thank you very much for, for, the, uh, for all who listened in. And uh, thank you for your, your patient listening. And I, I hope some of your queries were answered. And uh, I wish you all a good evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Thanks. you. Thank you. Thank you.